All right, hour number four here on the Nick Hanley Show, AM 590 ESPN Omaha. And as we led off telling you that the Oklahoma and Texas to the SEC is basically done. They officially apply for membership of the SEC. So if there was even any talk, and I know some people kind of been floated out there that maybe Texas would be a better fit for the Big Ten, well, they're at least going to try for the SEC. And it sounds like that is all going to happen. As we go to the Limitless Mail Medical Hotline and welcome in Dirk Chatlin of the Omaha World Herald. And uh, Dirk, we were talking off the air too. It's it's amazing. It's hard, especially for us in Nebraska, to to see all this happening and not sort of go back 10 or so years ago when Nebraska, even with some of the rumors that were circulating that Nebraska was looking for the Big Ten and then how quickly that just gained so much steam and then ended up being official. But I just remember back then the, the Big 12 and – all of the the entire well really the, the entire conference maybe other than Texas seemed to have their own gripe and you just didn't know who was sort of being serious with maybe some threats to leave and and who was actually you know really just kind of using it maybe as leverage or to, to sort of vent towards the the conference and you know right now when this news broke a few you know a few days ago I thought well, maybe this is some type of power play by Oklahoma and Texas to get something out of the Big 12. Maybe it's a bigger TV deal, whatever they might be looking for, and thinking this might just be one of those types of situations. And we learned that, no, nope, they're they're ready to, to get out of there. And it's just it, – it's very fascinating, yet it's it's also hard not to sort of feel for those remaining members in the in the Big 12 right now. Yeah, I have a lot of different emotions because on one hand, I, I do feel – you know, I feel really bad for Iowa State, especially. Um, you know, they're going to have potentially uh, the best season in school history coming up, and and nobody nobody outside of Ames is going to be talking about it because it's going to be all about what's happening in the league and outside of the league. Um, in in one sense, it's it's a really interesting sort of I don't know social experiment about what's happened in the Big Twelve over the last really 30 years because you know this all started in the in the early 1990s and and you know you kind of had two um two conferences that that didn't have as much population probably didn't have as much television exposure as, as some other places um that teamed up you know trying to trying to solve a problem and it just was never a very good match and it feels like the same issues you know, that plagued the league in 1996 or 2009 or whatever, uh, are, have, have just never really gone away. And, and Texas, you know, is never really happy. Um, uh, they're kind of a, you know, it's easy to sort of do the, the metaphor of the, you know, the high maintenance person in a relationship that's always looking for a way out or something to change in their significant other or spouse. And, you know, it's like what what could Kansas or or Oklahoma State or Iowa State do about it? I mean, there's just they can't double their population. They can't uh, they can't force ESPN or Fox to to throw more money at them. Uh, it was just in some ways it was kind of doomed. And yet, at the same time, um, you know, it's inevitable. And yet, it's still stunning at the same time because I mean, Nick, you got to have some serious serious guts in the state of Oklahoma, for instance, to turn your back and just totally betray, you know, a hundred years of conference history and uh, specifically your relationship with Oklahoma State. I mean, I can't imagine how tense that's going to be in the state of Oklahoma over the next, you know, five to ten years, especially if Okie State doesn't find a, a good conference home. Yeah. So, you know, for Texas, this is sort of, you know, par for the course, and I, I've got my gripes with Texas, but, um, you know, the fact that Oklahoma did it too and, and did it, you know, basically stabbing Okie State in the back uh, is is just kind of shocking. I mean, and like I said, it's inevitable and it's stunning at the same time. What we did see a while back was when Missouri, and, and it was kind of funny, Missouri was actually one of the first that was inquiring about the Big Ten before Nebraska, and I know everybody kind of forgets about that, but yeah, Missouri leave for the SEC, Nebraska to the Big Ten, Colorado to the Pac-12, Texas A&M to the SEC, and really we were thinking, okay, it just seems like this is an old Southwest Conference situation where that 
conference, the Big 12 as it was, was going to see this mass exodus and they would cease to exist. And somehow, and probably a big reason, Dirk, is because Oklahoma and Texas stood pat and those are huge brands, very good athletic departments. They pull in a lot of revenue that that was probably the main reason they were able to survive it. And I, I got nothing but but good things to say about Bob Bowlesby other than the inability to, to get a conference TV deal done. But now without those two in the conference, it's just hard to imagine how this conference, amongst the, the power four or five or however we're going to end up labeling in the future, how, how this conference survives as is. I agree. I mean, it's try putting together a, you know, a football media rights deal uh, built upon West Virginia and Iowa State and Kansas State. It, it's not going to go very far. So, um, you know, I'd be, if I were those big 12 schools, I'd be looking for life rafts. And I'm sure, you know, West Virginia has probably reached out to the ACC already. Uh, you know, I think Kansas and Iowa State are probably putting as many feelers in the Big Ten as they can. It's just a really ominous position for those remaining schools. And, um, you know, it just, you feel really, really bad. I mean, it's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of good, uh, good old fashioned rivalries in this part of the country, uh, specifically on the basketball side. I think they're, they're going to be disrupted. Uh, you know, you may, you may not have a situation where, where, uh, Kansas is going to Oklahoma state anymore, or, you know, Kansas is going to, to Hilton, uh, for a for a Wednesday night basketball game in January, and that's that that hurts. I mean, that's that's a big part of the the sports heritage in this part of the country, and and I just you know I I think that's the part that I'm sure Oklahoma and Texas are super excited to go where they're going, but but I you know when you're responsible when it's when it's everybody else's blood on your hands, uh, and you're kind of the one who who spearheaded this massive, massive change. Uh, I, I got to think that that comes with, with a little bit of a uh, tinge of regret. And, and I think, you know, those two schools, while they're obviously going to make a heck of a lot more money, you know, their fan bases aren't going to see that money and their fan bases aren't going to, you know, they're not going to uh, lower the ticket prices yeah. uh, in Norman, Oklahoma, because they're going to the SEC. And I just, I don't know. This, there, there's got to be a little bit of mixed emotions, I would think, even in those two schools as they embark on this this big adventure. That that frankly, this is the part that we haven't discussed is is very likely to change the course of college athletics. You know, overwhelmingly. I mean, it's. Uh, I think the SEC has identified uh, uh, a flaw in the NCAA wiring that they mm-hmm. just are not very interested in leading. Uh, leading this type of operation and governing this many schools and this many, you know, high profile football schools. And I think the SEC is, is ready to jump into that void and basically, you know, create uh, a whole new world, um, you know, that will probably include the big 10 and the PAC 12. But, but I think the SEC wants to be first to sort of say, this is what college athletics needs to look like for the next 25 years. And we're going to write the rule book the way we see fit. Talking with Dirk Chatlin of the Omaha World Herald here on AM590. And Dirk, I know you have a piece out there about you know the Texas effect of this too. And Texas is now fit in the SEC and a program. And I know that there we can relate to this in some way, shape, or form with Nebraska. A program that sometimes feels that its its image is a lot greater than how it's actually perceived around them. And for Texas, though, it's kind of amplified. And for Texas, you know, it's Again, we can talk about Nebraska all we want, but Texas, they take it to another level. When you when you think about what they're now going to be up against and what the spotlight is now going to show about Texas, you know, what are your thoughts just about them and the SEC compared to what we've seen over the last 50 years with Texas? Well, it makes me laugh because the SEC, you know, the SEC is not going to care at all who Texas is. They're not going to care about Texas's money or political poll or um, – you know, in the Big 12, schools had to be deferential to Texas just because they feared, you know, they feared their resources. They feared what they might do. Uh, they Honestly, they feared a, a situation like this. Mm-hmm. The SEC is not going to care about that at all. I mean, LSU is is going to laugh the first time Texas, you know, tries to 
get the conference championship game moved to San Antonio or something like that. I mean, it's just, uh, I'm not saying the SEC isn't going to be interested in moving into Texas, but, but they will feel no responsibility uh, to make Texas happy. And I think that's the part that, that is going to be a little bit comical to see it unfold. It's just that, you know, again, to use the metaphor, you've got the, you've got a high maintenance uh, individual who, you know, the world has sort of revolved around them for the last, oh, 25 years in their conference. And, and they're moving into a situation where, frankly, nobody's going to care what they think. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, the SEC is glad to have their, their TV markets and their tradition and all that. But, but I don't think Texas is going to have a whole lot of say in what happens. And that might be a, a sort of a cold reality once they, once it sinks in. And, uh, you know, competitively, I don't think Texas is going to be great by any means. I mean, it's, I, I would imagine that the floor for them in the Big 12 for football was probably, you know, seven and five, eight and four. And I would think the floor in the SEC is, is a couple of losses more than that. So, yeah. uh, they got to get their act in order if they're going to, if they're going to compete with, with Alabama and LSU and, and even, you know, Mississippi State, Mississippi and schools like that. So, it's uh it's going to be really interesting to watch. I don't think anybody's going to be rooting for them either inside the SEC or certainly with certainly on the outside. I, I know they're not going to have any fans in the Big Twelve, um, and it's you know it, money money solves things from an administrative level. It doesn't make fans happy, right. and that's I think that's one of the lessons of this whole thing. Is it's like you know what good is money? If it if it doesn't make your fan base happy, and, and it's not going to make Texas's fan base happy if they're still going five and seven in five years. Well, and Dirk, I know now. And speaking of money, that the Big Ten Conference and its membership have been very happy with the amount of money they have got. Now, a lot of eyes shift from the SEC to the Big Ten and say, "Okay, what's your move now?" You know, we showed you our cards. If if we all believe that the SEC is indeed done with adding, but we showed you our cards now, Big Ten your move, what are you going to do? And I feel like this idea that the Big Ten must expand, at least, you know, make an announcement within the next year, it it seems like, I don't know, to me, Dirk, maybe that's a knee-jerk reaction because I do feel like you've got to make sure you're identifying a school or schools that is going to make sense for you both financially and competitively, and I don't know if there's a lot of those options right now. Yeah, I think Nebraska made sense for the Big Ten because it sort of made it whole. Uh, it was the 12th school. It, it rounded out the divisions. It added another another football, uh, you know, traditional powerhouse. Mm-hmm. Now Nebraska has not lived up to the billing, but it was it was a good decision at the time. I think uh, the the Rutgers and Maryland thing was a mistake because it it not only made the conference too big, in my opinion, conferences should be should be maximum 12 schools. Uh, but you know, those two schools didn't they didn't add. Uh, much prestige or even even uh, you know TV markets to a contract or something like that. It, it's I think the Big Ten needs to learn from the Rutgers Maryland experience and realize that if you're going to expand, it has to be a no brainer. It has to be schools that are going to dramatically you know enhance your image and your your marketability across the country. And and to me, the only schools that really do that are are either in the ACC or they're on the West Coast. Um, yeah, you know, I think you can make an argument that that you know if you could grab North Carolina and Duke or Clemson and North Carolina or or you know the best of the ACC, I think you know Florida State, Miami, uh, I think you could you could make an argument that the Big Ten gets gets stronger. Uh, I certainly think that they would you know be interested in, in USC, UCLA uh, or Stanford, Cal, USC, UCLA. Uh, but again, I think schools and conferences have to be very careful that they don't get so big that they're basically ruining the fan experience. Mm-hmm. And I, I think at some point the pendulum is going to swing back uh, to where schools and their fan bases realize that, hey, it was a lot more fun when we were playing the same schools every year. You know, yeah. when, we were, when we were creating and bolstering traditional rivalries um, you know, as opposed to this this new world we live in now, where in the SEC, for instance, you know, if you're Georgia, you might play you might play Oklahoma once every five years. Uh, that's not a conference 
you know, rivalry. That's not even really a conference relationship. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, I, the Big Ten needs to be careful that whatever it does uh, is sort of a no-brainer addition because I don't think adding schools just to match the SEC uh, is going to make you stronger in the long run. Dirk, before I let you go, too, and I haven't had a chance to talk to you since the the hiring of Trev Alberts, and we've had a chance to see him speak on a couple of occasions now, both at the introductory press conference and a Big Ten Media Days. What what were your just early impressions of the hire, and, and what have you kind of taken away? It, it feels like the announcement was made like two months ago, but it, honestly, it's only been a little more than a week and a half or so. Yeah, you, you think about all the stuff that's happened in Omaha this summer right. from a from a sports news standpoint, and it's, it's pretty shocking. Yeah. Uh, but but the biggest news is probably uh, Nebraska's athletic director situation. And, and I think, uh, you know, there was a perception that, that Alberts didn't have enough uh, support or popularity, you know, across the board to be, to be Nebraska's AD. And I think that might have been true at some point. But now that he's been named and has the job, uh, I think it feels like a pretty natural fit. You know, I think he checked more boxes than anybody else, any other candidate. Mm-hmm. Uh, I certainly think he has the credibility to lead the department and to sort of restore some some organization and discipline and unity to the department. Um, I think he is probably best equipped to handle whatever comes up uh, in the football program or, you know, God forbid if if there needs to be a coaching change at some point, I think that would be very difficult for someone, uh, you know, totally totally new to Nebraska to make that type of decision. I think Alberts is is better equipped to handle that, and frankly, to help Scott Frost uh, sort of get over the hump. I think he probably has more institutional knowledge than anybody uh, in contention for that job. So it, it's just a real natural fit, I think. Uh, and you know, for him to be successful, he's going to need. He's going to need Frost to, to take a big step here in the next year or two, but but uh, I, I think it was a really good decision by uh, by the power brokers at Nebraska. Yep, I don't totally agree. Dirk Chatlin with the Omaha World Herald, good write up on the conference, uh, the SEC at least conference realignment there too, and in Texas, all fun stuff. <laughs> especially when it's it's Texas and us as Nebraska get a chance to look at it and say, all right, good luck with that. But uh, give it a read. Dirk, appreciate you coming on, my man. Have a great one. Okay, take care. All right, when we come back, we will take a little bit more uh, look into the early Nebraska fall camp storylines as we talked about earlier. Uh, you've heard a little bit about the quarterback-center relationship and that work. Now, also, when you start talking about the defense, a lot of positive storylines there. But what must happen early for this group to sort of show its worth? We'll get to that right after the break.